All right, I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the City of Pasadena. My name is Chris Markarian. I'm the Deputy Director, City Engineer, representing the Department of Public Works. And today I have with me our project team, including our consultant, as well as our client, which is, of course, the Department of Library services and we have been working on this project for some time so the intent here today is to give you a little bit of a historic background of how this project got initiated and moving forward where we are today which is in the preliminary design phase and also a lot of the outreach here today the focus is going to be on programming two things that we have been tasked by our city council. So uh, with that, we can do introductions as we go along. And I also want to make mention that there are translation services available. So anyone who has a need to please ask uh, our staff. We have Teo Sierra, who's the project manager. Teo, you want to? Raise your hand there, and uh, we'll be happy to assist anyone. Are you all able to hear me okay? I'm getting a little bit of feedback on my end. Okay, all right. I'll just ignore my own voice. <laughs> all right, wonderful. So um, I have been with the city about seven years and have been involved on this project from day one. As the library was to near its 100 year anniversary, we decided as a city and the library department to take a look and assess the condition of the library. We started with a lot of the safety and uh, fire alarm system and as well as fire sprinkler system for the building. So we hired on a consultant back in 2020 to do that. So even before the Central Library became a project, there was another project called Building Systems Assessment. And as a part of that, we also brought on a structural engineering consultant to look at the condition of the building structure. And it's at that time that we really searched and found, located the original plans, construction plans of the library, and uh, discovered that the building was, uh, the walls, all of the gravity walls, are, unif are unreinforced masonry. And what that means is, as of 1930s, after the earthquake, uh, any buildings built in the state of California, uh, unreinforced masonry was basically outlawed, it was no longer allowed by code. And this building built in the mid 1920s, we found to be of unreinforced masonry construction. Now that being said, this is a Myron Hunt design building, um, a renowned architect, and the construction was very much unique of its time. And we found that, um, you know, it was very, uh, I guess innovative, I would say, for its time in construction. And uh, our consultant will go in a little more detail about it. But with the, given the finding, we had a discussion with the city manager's office as well as our city's building official. And in compliance with our unreinforced masonry ordinance requirement, which states that buildings must be retrofitted, and or demolished, we had to, given the use, the fact that we have over 900 people using this building on a daily basis, the decision was made to uh, vacate the building and until such time that the building is retrofitted and made safe for the public in case of an earthquake event. So that is where we, that takes us to back in May of 2021. Uh, moving forward, we, our first task was to do a preliminary analysis. We found 
that we wanted to do additional uh, materials testing, we did geotechnical investigation work, and we brought on board a second structural engineering firm to do an independent reevaluation of the preliminary structural analysis. And they, in fact, concurred with the findings, and we, at that point, put out a request for a proposal to solicit uh, services of a comprehensive design team, meaning we wanted a, a well-established uh, consulting firm with a proven record in retrofit and design of historically significant libraries and buildings of this magnitude and significance. As you all know, the Central Library is the uh, really cornerstone to the Bennett plan for the Civic Center and the first building that was constructed as part of Pasadena Civic Center. So um, moving forward with all the due diligence, which took about a year's time, we also decided to put together a technical oversight committee as well as a programming committee. So the Technical Oversight Committee was, uh, a, was one that was assembled by our mayor, Victor Gordo, and it comprised of uh, seismologists and uh, educators in the field of seismology and engineering from Caltech, as well as several principal uh, engineers from various reputable firms in Southern California. In addition, we work closely with Pasadena Heritage, as well as we had architects from the community and the American Institute of Architects, AIA, the Southern California chapter, Foothill chapter, included as part of the steering committee, who really had a very engaged role in um, helping us progress through the, not only the preliminary analysis findings and reviewing and being able to advise us as well as uh, report to the mayor, but also they helped vet through all of the various retrofit schemes. Uh, that was our first task, was to come up with a viable retrofit uh, concept so that based on that, we can move forward with everything else, with the design. That being said, we hired on, at that point, our design consultant that is uh, here and uh, will be addressing you shortly. And, uh, with that, we also, the library and the city manager at the time put together a programming committee. Because uh, as was discussed by city council, the fact that the library was closed, the fact that we were gonna be doing this retrofit work, uh, it was an opportune time to take a look at what the needs are of the community, not only current needs, but also needs moving forward. So the vision for this project in general is to make sure that we bring this building up to a current standards in a sense to extend its life and make sure that uh, it's put to great use by the community for the next 100 years plus. So with that, what I do want to let you know a little bit about where we're headed next. Uh, our structural uh, analysis work is uh, continuing. We, we are doing some additional testing right now, and we're going through all of the programming phase, and uh, we have the library here who can speak to that. And going forward for next year, early next year, we will be presenting um, the schematic design and some of the programming findings, what we heard from you, to our city council and move forward. But one critical decision that was made back in September was uh, a direction and uh, from city council on an earthquake retrofit scheme 
And that's where the schematic design is taking shape based on, on that scheme. And there's more to come on that. Um, as you know, the most important thing is to reopen this library as soon as we can for the community. And what you see there is we anticipate completing design by the end of this year so that we may um, at the same time look for grant funding and other ways of funding construction of the project. A little bit about the funding aspect. We have acquired state funds earmarked uh, by the state for the design phase of the project. However, the construction of the project remains unfunded at this time. And we are certainly uh, have a, a team of consultants as well as the city working to uh, and applying for grants at both the state and federal level. Uh, beyond that, uh, we can maybe talk about additional next steps towards the end of this uh, presentation. So with that, I'd like to ask the library, Tim McDonald, Director of Library Services, to continue. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to make sure I adjust the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes? Great. Thanks. Um, my name is Tim McDonald. I'm the Library Director for the City of Pasadena. Briefly, just want to thank Pasadena High School for hosting us here today. I want to thank Pasadena Media for recording today's event. It's a busy holiday season, and uh, we did not expect a full house. We've got a thousand extra seats, I think, here today. But people that couldn't be here tonight will have the opportunity to watch this meeting, thanks to Pasadena Media being here. Um, and most of all, thank you to all of you being here. You're an essential part of this process, so we get this project right. We're talking about a very important building in the city, and we want to have a transparent process that's really engaged with the community every step of the way. I'm going to talk a little bit about the vision that was set for this project. A um, few slides back. Oh, can I ask you to? Oh, perfect. Thanks, thanks, Deborah. A um, few slides back, Chris showed that long brown bar on the timeline that was um, the analysis of the building, really checking and double checking that the building official had made the right decision on the need to red tag the building. Um, and retrofit it. And then parallel with that, there was a green stripe that said programming. We knew it was very important to take this opportunity while the library was closed to start a community-driven examination of this process and really check in with the community on what they wanted to see happen. Um, how can we address the current needs of the community and the future needs so that the next hundred years of this building are really forward thinking? Uh, so the first step in that process was creating a community programming committee that was formed even before the Grun Associates design firm was awarded its contract. Uh, September of 2022, um, the city manager appointed members to that committee and um, their work began. And the mission of that um, committee is there on the screen for you to recommend how central library spaces can be reimagined to draw more people into the building and to continue to serve as a primary gathering space for the community um, and reimagining the, the central, um, as the central building in the library system. We're very fortunate that we have a, a library system with nine library branches, but just like a tree's branches, they can't function effectively alone. Uh, the model of this library is to have a centralized library system to support those neighborhood branches. Um, the, the committee um, that I'm talking, that I just mentioned, was charged with thinking about how that central library, as I said before, could, could meet uh, the needs of the community moving forward. And talk about that a little bit. Um, could I go to the next slide? Next. These are the 11 members that um, offered, volunteered their time and expertise to the project, um, representing a wide section of the community, representing nonprofits, education, the media, um, historic preservation, library professionals. And over the course of several months, several meetings, they really dug into the question of 
how will we best serve the community moving forward? How can we reimagine spaces so that we are thinking ahead uh, for the community? Go to the next slide. That um, group came out with a, uh, a set of key, eight key recommendations that are listed on the screen now. Anything in this presentation uh, that I'm moving too fast on, just know that this is all recorded and there is a project web page that you can refer to, including the entire report that this committee um, published in February of 2023. Key recommendations from the community um, for Central Library were to maintain the historic character of this beloved building. That was their top recommendation. Design spaces that better meet the needs of 21st century libraries and create positive user experiences. Make improvements to accessibility. If you're someone who's ever tried to wheel a baby carriage, a stroller, or a wheelchair, or been on crutches and tried to get into the building, you know that that's an area where we have some opportunities to make improvements. Um, it's important to the community programming committee to remain true to the mission of the library as an information center that is free and welcoming to all. Um, responding to community needs and to reach out to the community to identify further needs. It was very important to the community that this um, community engagement did not end with them, but started with them. And that's part of the reason we are meeting tonight. And we'll talk a little bit more about the community engagement plan that's been created as a result of the vision of the programming committee. Also to consider new and innovative ways of offering service and to promote all that the library has to offer. Um, to supplement the vision of the programming committee, the committee charged staff with conducting further outreach to the committee, to the community, like today's event, so that we're not just reaching people that are current library users, but also reaching parts of the community that are not current library users. So we have a lot of scheduled meetings like tonight to gather um, input from the community, but we also have pop-up events and are going uh, to places where regular library users might not be to talk to every um, segment of the community. Let me go to the next. Oh, perfect. Okay. As well as those eight key recommendations, you're reading my mind, Sorry. Deborah. Thank Sorry. you. You're perfect. Um, the committee also um, uh, gave us a list of cautions that they wanted us to keep in mind, and that those are listed on the screen now. Don't just provide any library, provide the very best library. There's a great deal of pride felt in the community for Central Library. Um, the library system as a whole celebrates its 140th birthday in 2024. The library system's older than the city itself was um, formed before the, the city incorporated. And I can tell you as a library director, every time I meet someone and tell them what my job is, I will hear a story about fond memories of going to Central Library and um, time spent with their grandparents teaching them how to read or studying for a college degree. I've met a couple that became engaged at Central Library. There are a lot of really um, fond memories of this building. Um, so they want to make sure that they don't, we don't just have any library but the very best library. Um, wanted to make sure we maintain the core mission of the library as an information delivery system that is free and welcoming to all, that we're helping um, our youngest residents prepare for a healthy and successful life and um, have academic success, contribute to the economy by helping people on their career journeys and support for small businesses and learning and literacy. Um, the, the committee cautioned us to avoid duplicating services that can be better offered other places. So for example, we may partner with other groups to provide services and programs in the library, but not um, reimagine the job of a librarian. So the example I offer is we're not going to train our staff how to inoculate people with flu shots, but we could certainly pro provide a room for Huntington Hospital to come and send their nurses over so that we could offer that service for free to the community. So we're gonna avoid duplicating services that are better handled by others. Um, we wanna find a balance, the, community, the committee told us, between dedicated spaces and flexible spaces. We're in a dedicated space. This is an auditorium with fixed seating, but the library should also offer flexible, multi-purpose spaces, the community told us, that could um, accommodate many functions. And, and we will be seeing some examples of the current design 
um, scheme that addresses that wish. And then finally, uh, avoid uh, be cautious of a kitchen sink mentality. We can't be everything to all people. Uh, if we could find a space for a rock climbing wall, uh, <laughs> that may not be the best use of the space. Um, we, have to, we have to make sure that we make judicious decisions about what can be in the library. Next one. Thanks, Deborah. Okay, so as I said before, the, the committee did not want the decisions about programming to end with them. They told us we needed to do further community outreach, and so a robust um, community engagement plan was developed, and this is some of the feedback feedback that we received from the community that tells us about the types of activities, services, functions um, that they would like to see in the library. So it's a real wish list. And those green check marks show that um, the current design scheme is accommodating all of those activities in one way or the other, either with a dedicated space or with a flexible space that could, could offer each one of those activities. And um, the exciting part of the presentation will be showing you some renderings of those spaces. Uh, anybody that's interested in the coffee cart uh, that used to um, grace our courtyard can know that that was a piece of feedback we heard from many members of the community and made the list, and we've got space for that when we reopen to go to the next one, Deborah. Thanks. And uh, as well as activities, some qualities, services, and functions, activities, events that the community would like to see in the library. And again, we've made the opportunity for these to happen in the current um, design. And I should say, and I think Deborah will repeat this, the design that we're showing tonight is not a final design, it's just the current version of it, which we are always adapting and evolving based on the input we've received from the community and library staff. Um, so, um, I'll add too that that laundry list, that wish list that we saw, includes many uses that are already part of the library system. Um, we are not just a depository of books, but we're a community gathering space where, um, as Chris said earlier, nearly a thousand people visited every day before our closure. Um, there are opportunities for city-led functions and community events, a space where a community group could come and have a meeting, a performance, um, an art installation. These are some pictures of past events, and I'll ask you to go to the next slide. And here's just a kind of a, a sample of what you would have seen in Central Library before we closed. We're talking about a big collection uh, of 30,000 items in Central Library that are free and available to all cultural events, author visits, support for school success. Um, in the year before the pandemic, we had 500 events in the Donald Wright Auditorium, one room in the library hosted them. We we're truly the living room of, of, the, of the community, and we are hoping to be that again when we reopen. Okay, go to the next one. Thanks. I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah, who's gonna talk about, lead the rest of the presentation, starting with how did the vision that the community programming committee gave us lead to the specific goals and objectives for the project. Thanks, Deborah. Great. Thanks, Deborah. Okay. That was a little, <clears throat> quite a bit taller than me. Uh, all right, so hi, my name is Deborah Gerard. I'm a partner at Grun Associates and the project lead for uh, this design effort. And so this section, we're gonna talk about the project goals, uh, including historic uh, uh, characteristics of the building and the outreach we've done to date. Um, so the goals and objectives, once we got the, once we got on board and once we got, uh, uh, became familiar with the visioning report that was done by the programming committee and met with our client, we were really able to put together a comprehensive list of project goals and objectives. And it's, it's uh, obviously this project was initiated by the fact that this building is unreinforced masonry and we had an obligation to improve its uh, seismic performance. But the, the city also, as Tim has already mentioned, recognized that only looking at that was maybe um, missing an opportunity to take care of other things that in this building that was 100 years old or just about 100 years old, that it really deserved to be looked at again. The, the library and the library system, the offerings that a library has, as 
Tim has mentioned, are very different than that, what they were 100 years ago. So are the services. Uh, Wi-Fi obviously did not exist 100 years ago. Uh, the needs for power and the way mechanical systems function, energy efficiency, et cetera. So there are a lot of things that just were not here 100 years ago. And so the city really tasked us to look broadly so that we're not missing an opportunity, that the city's not undertaking this important uh, retrofit and repair and overlook something that was, um, you know, could easily have been accommodated if we had just looked at it. And so together with our client, we developed this list of the goals and objectives for the project. So the first is the earthquake uh, repairs that uh, are obviously driving this. Uh, second is life safety. So as Chris said, this actually started out um, as a discovery done during a life safety improvement project. And uh, so we, we needed to improve the life safety of the building. And that includes the level of earthquake repair too. So life safety deals with the uh, fire systems and the sprinkler systems, but also how resilient the building would, uh, would or should be and what's the right balance for this building. Uh, very critical, this is a beloved historic building in the city of Pasadena. This was the first building in the Bennett Plan which formed the civic core of, of Pasadena. And uh, so there are three buildings in that uh, Bennett Plan, City Hall, the Civic Auditorium, and the Central Library, and this was the first one completed. Very, very critical that uh, we take all appropriate measures to preserve this library. And uh, I'll talk in a second about what that means in historic terms. Uh, accessibility, not something that was really uh, considered 100 years ago, but something that we uh, consider very much now. Uh, we want to make sure that there's universal access to this building, and it's not just people who might have specific disabilities, but really uh, helping everyone, uh, whether they have a mobility challenge, whether they're elderly, whether they've got child, uh, in a stroller, uh, whatever the case may be, to be able to utilize this building. And currently, the building does not uh, accomplish what it needs to, and so uh, improving its accessibility is a key part of this. Uh, we found that it was really important to be a public benefit. A public building uh, needs to be a benefit to the public, and while this building is not occupiable, while it's red tagged, it is not serving its purpose. And so it is critical that we find a way for the public to be able to reoccupy the building as quickly as is reasonable. And, uh, um, and that way the, the patrons can utilize it. Uh, we have to mitigate risks. Um, there's a lot of risks in doing renovation projects and it's important that we're really looking broadly at that. The, the key risks are schedule delays which lead to cost increases. And so it is uh, our, our uh, directive, our mission, to make sure that we're managing the schedule, managing expectations, and delivering on our commitments. Uh, Tim mentioned function and, and uh, uh, taking a look at how the building functions right now. And, and some of this is functioning for the staff. How do we make the spaces better for the staff to utilize so that they're more efficient in what they do, so that they can then do more things for the patrons of the library? Uh, flexibility, uh, Tim also mentioned that, that it's really important that spaces have as much flexibility inherent in them so that over the next 50 and 100 years that this building can continue to evolve as uh, the needs of the community evolve. And then lastly, uh, to upgrade outdated uh, technology and uh, critical building systems. It's stunning to us that the 100-year-old mechanical systems are still in use. Um, they, they are um, on their last legs. They have well li outlived their uh, reasonable lifespan. And this is a good moment. Uh, we need to uh, look towards the environment and, and uh, making sure that we're providing better, uh, more efficient uh, systems in the building, but also uh, providing more power for people who have more things to plug in and Wi-Fi for uh, the obvious purposes of that. Okay, uh, historic, historic Character. Historic Resources Group was a consultant on our team and they 
uh, took a deep dive into all the aspects of this building and what made uh, this uh, historic uh, uh, building and, and what was really critical that we protect. And they prioritized the things that were character defining in, in terms of the most character defining and uh, other things that were non-contributory to um, its historic listing. The massing and materials are at the top of the list. The outside of the building, absolutely, we need to protect. We, we are told, uh, don't change the massing, don't change the materials. And what that also means is, uh, to the reasonable extent possible, do not alter the actual historic material that is there. Uh, on the inside, uh, organization and finishes are considered the most character defining. And uh, the, the image that you see here of the Great Hall has, uh, is repeated in uh, all of the other significant halls in, in the building. There is uh, built-in wood casework down below, acoustic plaster up above, and uh, cork flooring. Uh, sometimes the flooring is not cork, but uh, uh, this basic parti is repeated in all of these historic rooms, and, and this is uh, defining uh, the interior of the space. Um, you'll take note that one thing that is not listed and, and uh, was in the report as non-contributory is the actual substrate. So our consultant told us that things that cannot be seen are not uh, do not rise to the Secretary of Interior standards. And uh, we, of course, being good architects, double check that to make sure they're telling us the truth. And, uh, and so it is. So the substrate of the building is not considered to be part of its historic uh, character defining elements. One other thing that uh, was just remarkable that Myron Hunt did was he integrated air conditioning ductwork into the walls. So uh, at the last community meeting, I, I know many people who are here uh, attended that as well. And in other presentations, we've really done a dive into the structure of the building. This one is really focused on programming, so we're not uh, spending as much time on that. But I just wanted to give you a, a little snippet of what this looks like. So the section on the left is the basic structure of the building. And again, this is repeated in all of these main halls. Um, the big thick uh, red line on the left is about three bricks wide. It's uh, uh, considered a width of brick. It's made up of three bricks wide, about 12 inches. Um, and there's a gap in between. And then there's another red brick line, which is another three bricks. So 12 inches of brick, a 12 inch air gap, and another 12 inches of brick. And that air gap isn't continuous. The, the, the two walls are tied together at various intervals with ribs. But the purpose of that air gap is really important. It was so that air conditioning ducts could be fed through the wall and therefore uh, come out, uh, have a grill out at the top of the book stack. Um, so the air conditioning comes out the, of the top. There's a return air opening down at the bottom. And in this manner, this building is air conditioned without you seeing ductworks, uh, uh, ductwork uh, running around it. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, this is something that is high at the list of character defining and something that we really needed to uh, preserve. In the picture on the right, you'll see we uh, did a little experimentation to remove, carefully remove, document, and store. Um, the, uh, some of the existing woodwork to make sure that what's behind us, uh, behind that woodwork is what we expected, and that's exactly what we expected. Uh, there is a duct in every one of these cavities, um, which is not surprising since there's a grill in every cavity. And uh, you can see the, the brick on the right is what was covered up by the casework. All right, community outreach. Um, we've done uh, several of these meetings, and we're trying to spread ourselves around the, the community, and uh, we will continue to do so throughout the next six months as we continue to develop uh, the finite details of this project, including pop-ups. And uh, as we got community feedback, we found that it was remarkably consistent with the feedback that the visioning committee gave us. Um, but in addition, uh, you know, almost 
everybody had a personal connection to the library of one sort or another. When they were a kid, when their grandparents brought them, they're bringing their kids. The number one question we're asked is, when is the library going to open again? And people want to use this building, so that's really, really important. Um, they obviously uh, uh, um, were very concerned that its historic character remain, that in uh, the work that we're doing that we don't erode that character. But they want better bathrooms. <laughs> well, bathrooms always come up. Uh, they want better technology. So they want the, there to be more current and more modern accommodations while retaining the historic nature of the building. And they said the special events are super critical, as Tim's already kind of covered. All right, so enough of that. That's all the preamble. That was the appetizer. Here's the main course. Um, so this is our in-progress schematic design. I'll take you through some floor plans and then uh, show you some uh, visualizations and then dive into a little bit of where uh, those special places that Tim showed you with the check marks are in this building. Um, so just for uh, color coding, the pink are elevators. And uh, this building currently has um, two elevators that don't, they, they don't reach all the spaces in the building. Um, they're very small, and they don't meet uh, any of the current uh, standards for an elevator. And uh, one of them we are maintaining, the one off on the far right near the word law room. It's an existing elevator that will be refurbished. The other two are brand new elevators that will be uh, big enough for a stretcher to be in, certainly big enough for a wheelchair, and because this is a library, big enough for employees with library book carts as well. So um, uh, these will uh, serve uh, the levels that, uh, all the levels of the building so that you'll be able to access all spaces with an elevator. That is not something you can currently do and that's uh, sort of critical if you go back to the accessibility need. Um, in the uh, space that's called Circulation Hall, that's where the current book stacks are and I'm going to take you a quickly through the sequence where you would enter the building. So the way that Myron Hunt designed the building is that you would enter from the south side, and hopefully you'll see my cursor. Uh, you ascend a set of stairs, go through this courtyard, ascend another set of stairs, into a little vestibule, and then you enter into the Great Hall, which is the big space. Ho hopefully everyone who's here has been into the library and you remember the big grand space of the Great Hall. And then currently, this area here is very low height, seven foot high ceiling height, and this is uh, an area that's filled with stacks. We are proposing to remove those stacks. We need to, so I, I should point out that almost every intervention we're doing, we're doing because uh, it's being driven by something else that has to happen anyway, and so we're leveraging the opportunity to do something else with that. So we need to retrofit the walls in this area that's currently got book stacks in it. So we have to take the stacks out, we have to take the shotcrete out. The shotcrete that was put in in the 1980s uh, only supports the book stacks and, and we have to retrofit those walls so that they're seismically improved as well. And so when we do that, we're going to not put back the book stacks in quite the same manner, but we're going to take the opportunity to really open the space up. When we take those book stacks out of that area, up at the top are these skylights. And we realize that by opening the space up and instead of filling it back up with books, if we can ring it with uh, a series of mezzanines and leave the, the middle open, we'll be able to get light from those skylights all the way down uh, in, in order to flood this area with light. And one of the reasons we're so interested in this is um, as, so I talked about entering from the south. That's how Myron Hunt originally designed the building. But no, it's not widely used anymore. Um, people who park across the street or take public transit might use it. Anyone who's parking, uh, driving to the library and parking is generally coming in the north entrance. The north entrance did not exist when Myron Hunt originally designed it. It was a loading dock. So it's been repurposed into a north entrance but we're proposing to make it a, a better north entrance. And so uh, there's a staircase here that comes off of the parking. Uh, a little later in the show, uh, presentation, I'll show you how we make that accessible. And clearing out this vestibule so that it's 
a bigger, better vestibule akin to the one that was on the south and then emerging into the circulation hall. So you go from a staircase into a vestibule into a big volume space. That's what happens on the south. That's what we're proposing is also done on the north so that uh, you have, it's not the same experience, but uh, trying to balance out that experience and provide an equivalent experience. Um, so we've added an elevator in that location, very easy for people to see as they're walking in so that they'll have great intuitive uh, wayfinding. They'll know how to get to an elevator and up to the other levels. And uh, there's also staircases that uh, take you up to the other levels as well. And uh, uh, I will show you those other levels in a moment. Um, but first, going down. So this is the lower level. Um, which is, uh, has the lowest level of that, uh, that uh, stack area. So I, I didn't point out, but I will in a subsequent image, um, that we're proposing to put an opening in that uh, main level so that the light from the skylights can transcend all the way down to this lower level. Myron Hunt envisioned four levels of stacks. We are keeping to that vision of four levels of stacks and this lower level is the lowest of those four levels. So being able to tie them all together um, atmospherically, visually, uh, we thought was a, a good plan. And uh, that opening in the floor allows daylight to make it down to this lower level. Um, all the spaces that are in this tan color are public spaces. Everything that's not uh, colored in is a staff area. And, uh, and so these are the, the public spaces in the, circular, in, in the lower level. Um, so going back to that main level and then going up one is the mezzanine level. And uh, so this is again uh, something that exists in that circulation hall where there's a thin uh, row, uh, six foot, so it's not terribly thin, but a, a thinnish row of uh, uh, mezzanine where the book stacks would line the walls of that mezzanine, very much like is happening in all of the historic halls. And uh, so the height underneath that mezzanine will be seven feet, just like it is in the current stack area. The reason that this is different is that it's not covering an entire very large space. So you have a, a low ceiling and then you have this big opening. And that big opening allows you to get relief from uh, what might otherwise feel like a low space underneath the mezzanine. Going up one level is the second floor, and this would be the top level of, um, of that circulation hall. And you'll see there's a wider area on the west side so that we can get more book stacks in there. Um, around on the long uh, sides, there's again a wall-based uh, stack and then uh, adequate space for you to circulate past it. And you'll notice that the elevator uh, connects all of these levels. Uh, we do have a special space that I'll point out here, which is the gallery space up at the top of this page. And uh, it's one of the spaces to serve one of the community needs or requests that we're proposing be a local art gallery in some form. It might be uh, artist studios on some rotating basis. That's an operational uh, aspect that will be figured out as we go, but we are preserving that space, which has great uh, daylight coming in and uh, northern light, so it's great for artists um, as uh, an art gallery. Uh, so here's a, an image, an axonometric image of that circulation hall. So uh, as you see around the perimeter, uh, our book stack, so this is an image with the roof taken off, so you don't see those skylights, but they're up above this image. And uh, you can see that there are um, uh, these layers of uh, mezzanines uh, that all have book stacks in them. Um, I should have mentioned the circulation desk is being uh, relocated from that circulation, uh, the main hall into the circulation hall. Uh, for a couple of reasons, and it's so important. I'm actually going to go backwards here for a second. Um, so this is the circulation desk. Uh, it used to be right here, and people coming in from the north had to kind of walk around to get to that circulation desk. By, re by taking the existing desk, but relocating it and rotating it 90 degrees, we put it in a position of control so that whether you come in from the north or from the south, 
uh, you're in a position where you see the circulation desk and the, circulation, they, the staff at the circulation desk can know and see the patrons and, and be able to help them uh, effectively. Uh, I guess since I'm here, I'll also point out the new restrooms are, are just off of that great hall as well. Okay, so we we'll back to this. Yeah, you see this connection between the great hall and the circulation hall. This is an existing opening. This is not a new opening. And uh, we are just taking advantage of this ex existing opening to uh, really help connect these two spaces together so that even though they're serving slightly different uh, uh, interests or different needs, uh, they're, they're connected so that they're working in harmony. And uh, here's a, a, an in-progress rendering of uh, what the circulation hall looks like. I uh, see all the layers of books. Uh, these book stacks are seven feet tall so that it's easy for someone to uh, access the top shelf. And uh, it's just this wonderful room filled with books. And this harkens back to uh, many historic libraries, but it's also done in a, in a way that accommodates the current services and the current um, sensibilities uh, in the space. Um, you can see the light coming in from the skylights, and then over here is that opening down to the lower level. So taken from the circulation desk, this is the view that uh, the staff will have of this space, being able to really look across. And uh, for safety, security, wayfinding, uh, camaraderie, you'll be able to see your friend on the first mezzanine while, while you're standing on the second one uh, by looking across the space. It's very open and uh, we think inviting. This is a view from the Great Hall looking in towards that existing opening into the uh, circulation hall. And uh, this is a work in progress. We don't intend to have uh, people staring at the uh, legs of people walking on that mezzanine. So the railings haven't really been designed yet. Uh, that will be forthcoming as uh, design progresses. Uh, all right, so I want to talk a, a bit about book count because this is something that's very important. We just took out this stack area, and so we're, we're sure that everyone's wondering where all the books are going back into. And so we spent uh, a lot of time. We've got one of our staff members who's been dedicated to working with one of Tim's staff members to make sure that we've got uh, all of the book stacks and shelving accounted for uh, properly. And so in this um, uh, reimagined uh, layout. Um, we are accommodating 12,500 lineal feet of book shelving, which is what is needed and what is uh, being provided for serving the library collection. So it's been uh, quite an effort to make sure we're doing that and getting the books in the right places. And um, the blue on these other uh, little diagrams shows you all the places where book stacks are. Uh, talk briefly about the lower level. So again, we're very interested in leveraging opportunities and doing more good with, uh, uh, you know, with having one action do multiple good things. Um, and one of the things that we immediately noticed about the lower level is that there were seven different elevations on this lower level connected with stairs, a couple of ramps that weren't really compliant and uh, in some cases not connected to each other at all. You can't walk from the east end of the, of the lower level to the west end currently. Um, and uh, therefore these uh, services are all disassociated. In order for us to use this as the library goes forward, use this lower level, it is critical that we address accessibility. And that can be done in a number of ways, but it has to be accessible to people with disabilities, otherwise we cannot legally use it. And that would mean this whole large area of space would be out of commission for the library staff or public to use. Um, so we started looking at how to accomplish this and we found that we needed to improve the foundations to do the seismic repair work. The, um, the uh, foundations um, while they are reinforced concrete, they're not well reinforced and uh, the, the seismic uh, repairs require 
uh, improvements to those foundations. To get to the foundations, we have to take out the slab on grade. Once we take the slab on grade out, we have the opportunity to put it back in at a level, um, at an even level, so that we can make this entire space uh, level and accessible. And uh, so that is what we're proposing to do. When that slab comes out, um, we put it back in at a common level. And in the section, you can see that uh, some of the footings are higher. That's how we established what level that could be at, um, so that we were able to even this out across the space. Um, lower level utilization. We also um, started getting a, a little uh, more creative on how to uh, service uh, ducts, how to, how to get all those ducts that are hidden in the walls where they need to be without just starting at one end and going to the other, which is what's currently done. And we found that if we uh, made two mechanical rooms instead of one, we could get smaller ducts and uh, not have to go as far because they're uh, distributing to an area that's more localized to the individual mechanical rooms. And uh, so this image in, in the middle is one of uh, our staff who are looking in this space that's directly under the circulation, uh, uh, under the Great Hall. And it is filled with ducts. It is dusty, it is nasty. Um, and you can't use any of it at the moment as we go forward and relocate these mechanical rooms, you'll be able to, uh, we'll, we'll be able to redistribute how those ducts serve the walls in such a manner that we can regain space in, for usable purposes. So the studio is in such a space. You'll see that there's an area below the studio, which is where uh, we're reserving it for access for the ducts into the wall. Uh, but that studio is a space that would not have been possible to utilize um, without uh, making this move. And then those other two gray areas, these are staff areas that are able to be recaptured by our reconfiguration of the mechanical rooms and, uh, and how they serve uh, the ductwork. Uh, from accessibility, just a little diagram to show you all of the various uh, accessible interventions that are needed. We need a new ramp on the north entry um, to uh, get uh, people from the parking lot up to the library main level. Currently, um, there is a wheelchair lift, which is not beloved by anybody. And uh, it's not really seen as a, an equal accommodation for people with disabilities. It does nothing for uh, a, a parent with a stroller. And uh, so by putting in a ramp, we can uh, serve all of those needs. The ramp would start at the base of the stair and end at the top of the stair so that people are traversing in the same uh, traffic pattern and uh, the same walking pattern as uh, someone who does not need to utilize the ramp. I already mentioned the elevators uh, in the front of the building. Um, we also, this, this is a building uh, on a little hill. We've got a series of stairs that take you from Walnut Street up to the courtyard and then from the courtyard again up into the building. And we need to address uh, both of those. And so we've got a series of sloped walks and ramps that will allow us to get up to the courtyard level. And then from the courtyard level, another ramp that gets us to um, this other area, uh, which is level with the main uh, floor of the building. Courtyard, for those who know, has multiple levels. The uh, middle is lower, and the two sides are level with the inside of the building. And so um, th this is uh, a tricky thing to do without altering the character of the courtyard. And uh, so this is a visualization of the north entrance uh, that shows you the ramp that we just talked about and uh, where it starts at the base and ends at the top. Uh, here's another view of what that north entrance looks like um, with that intervention of the new ramp. And uh, this is a view of, um, a bird's eye view of the library from the south. So this would be Walnut Street looking at the south entrance. And so this side of the library is very much the same um, this sloped walk gets you, um, and a sloped walk is a walk that's less than 5%, so you don't need handrails. It's uh, considered easy to navigate. So the sloped walk gets you to the mid-landing of the stair, 
where you can cross over and take a ramp up to the courtyard level, and then you saw that other um, ramp from the courtyard. Um, I mentioned public restrooms, so we have um, new public restrooms on both the um, main level as well as on the lower level. So just off the Great Hall, we have uh, uh, new uh, multi-occupant restrooms. Uh, we have water fountains with bottle filling stations as well. And we also have new restrooms in the children's hall um, that can be used not only by a child, but also they're large enough that a parent can uh, join them to uh, take care of them. And uh, this image on the left are these tiny little existing bathrooms that are there. Um, they are very, very small, and I think this is any uh, improvement to these would be uh, very welcome. The auditorium, we've made um, uh, a lot of changes, not to the auditorium itself as much as to the support spaces that serve the auditorium. Um, uh, there is an accessibility with the auditorium as well. Uh, you can't get up on the stage either from the audience or from backstage. And we're serving, solving both of those. There's a wheelchair lift um, to get up on stage from the audience. And then we're putting in a stop on our new elevator to take advantage of that new elevator to get a, a access to uh, the backstage for performers. So we don't have to put in something new. We just have to add a stop there. And you can see by the magnitude of the orange color how much more backstage auditorium support space we've been able to put in. It includes a pantry um, that'll help with all the many events, uh, proper AV room, piano storage for the two pianos that exist and really need a, a place to be out of the way, a deeper stage which will accommodate better functions, uh, more functions, new green rooms, dressing rooms, and a toilet that is uh, available to the performers. Uh, meeting rooms for public use. Um, we are adding uh, four smaller study rooms and two larger meeting rooms. These are being added in one of the non-historic wings. And so the, the main building was built 100 years ago, but there were two um, wings that were added on the east side and a small addition on the west side that was done in the 60s. And so we're, we're adding these meeting rooms into the 1960s addition so that we're not interrupting the historic fabric of the historic halls. And then uh, the boardroom, which is a, a really special find. So the boardroom is up on the second level on the west end of the Great Hall. And uh, there's, uh, you climb a stair and, and you can get up to that landing right now. And currently, there's a third level up above that as well. I can take another narrow stair and get up to uh, uh, another office up above. And we found that that third level was not historic. It was added at some point. It's a little ambiguous as exactly when. And uh, by removing that third level that's non-historic, we uncover a, a beautiful arched window that's a replica of the one on the east side. I shouldn't say replica, it's a original historic, but it's the same as uh, the mirror of the one on the east side. And it really creates this uh, incredible opportunity for this room. And uh, I've got an image to show you apparently in a minute. Not <laughs> Not exactly where I thought it was going to be, um, but it'll be uh, short, shortly here, and I'll show you that. And then uh, a lot of space for uh, flexible events. Uh, the studio is a flexible event space, the innovation lab, the great hall. There's a space in the circulation hall on that main level that can uh, have uh, special events uh, in it, and the courtyard. And... Um, all right, so here is that uh, image of the boardroom. You see that beautiful arched window that when the third floor is removed, suddenly uh, comes back to purpose. And uh, this ceiling is uh, what the ceiling looked like previously uh, in this space. And uh, it just uh, creates a, a beautiful uh, high volume space that is a really special space in the building. And this is a space that nonprofits can utilize for their board meetings and things of that nature. All right, I'm going to ask Dean Howell, who's our Director of Landscape Architecture at Grown Associates, to talk a little bit about the site and the landscape. 
Thank you, Deborah. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of our landscape progress, so design progress, uh, as we go throughout. Um, so as we have started out with uh, looking at our different goals for the landscape, uh, we really wanted to honor the uh, historical significance of the building itself, the, the library, um, the classical lines of the garden itself, but we also wanted to update the landscape um, and make it more resilient, uh, climate change, also introducing California native plants, which in turn would then create a biodiversity and a pollinator garden as well, make it a pollinator friendly garden, attracting native uh, insects and bees and butterflies to the garden itself. And then finally, we wanted to make it really a, a learning garden a place for people to come, and uh, whether that's plant ID or uh, interpretive signage, to really create that sort of extension of learning from, from the library interior space to the exterior space, the outdoor spaces. Um, so this is just a, an overview of uh, the site itself. Uh, we looked at the north entry and the south entry, of course, um, enhancing that entry sequence um, and uh, the landscape at that entry. The north entry, of course, is, a, is one of the, the main ways that people enter into the library. And so really creating also the universal access that, that Deborah had discussed, but creating a, a little bit more enhanced uh, entrance with landscaping and more mature trees and palms. Um, and also looking at the layout of the parking, which I'll, we'll talk about in a second. The south entry in the courtyard, um, we really wanted to uh, you know, honor that classical design of the south entry with the hedges and look at the mature trees, the olive trees and the mature junipers and uh, really uh, accentuate that as well as, um, you know, creating the accessible pathways into the library and restoring that historic character. Um, and then in the courtyard, of course, uh, retaining uh, the historic palms that are there, that have been there. Um, and uh, really, uh, you know, preserving the, uh, that facade of the building. Um, then on the west side, uh, really creating something we're calling the library park, uh, really created amongst uh, the mature trees that are there, and it will be a community benefit uh, beyond just the library users and the kids, and really for all people in Pasadena. So we looked at um, the parking lot layout. Um, we really wanted to make it a little bit more intuitive. Um, there's a one-way circulation through most of the, the, the layout now. Um, we've removed uh, you know, one existing driveway to improve circulation. Uh, we've added uh, potential EV um, parking spots. We have you know, wider drive aisles that allow for better circulation on, on uh, two ends. Um, and then we've added uh, accessible spaces. We've increased the size of, of, the, of the stalls to make them code compliant and uh, made the ADA accessible uh, stalls also compliant as well. We've added, you know, landscape and other opportunities for shading for the, for the parking with trees and landscaping. But the, the main um, sort of uh, uh, introduction of the landscape would be in this library park. And in this park, as you can see from this, uh, this plan view, we'd have an outdoor story time classroom at the very top. Um, that would be a permeable paving and that elliptical shape there. Um, from the interpretive images, you can see the, the different kind of seating that might be there that we've taken um, a cue from the bas relief architectural elements that are around the, the doorway at the, in the courtyard and, and using that to create these, these areas for, for kids, could have story time, could have outdoor classroom. And then as you move down into this, from this flexible area uh, into this sort of more of a meandering path between two sort of mounds where people can sit and, and there could be more areas for people to, to for reading, um, you get to the, to the bottom area and this would be a, a labyrinth garden that would be surrounding uh, the existing olive tree that's there. 
uh, with seating. And in this labyrinth garden, there could be interactive play elements, you know, where kids could make uh, you know, musical notes from different elements that we might uh, have uh, within that labyrinth garden as well. So really, just creating this more of a park-like setting on the west side for the kids to enjoy, for library users to enjoy, and for all people from uh, in Pasadena to enjoy. Okay, so um, last, uh, last little bit here, talk about what our next steps are on the timeline for them. So um, we're looking, as uh, Chris mentioned, in early 2024 to be going to city council uh, to uh, talk about a funding strategy, but also to show them our progress on schematic design. Uh, we will be um, dealing with, uh, we are currently uh, doing a cost estimate on our uh, schematic design that'll be complete sometime in uh, the very beginning of next year. Um, and uh, we expect to roll right into design development uh, where we take things such as the railings and uh, the exact nature of how things really look, what exact um, finishes and developed design elements are, and uh, really get more into the details on those. Uh, some of the things we'll do during design development is you know, figure out where all the uh, power outlets should be and do seating layouts to you know, talk about different uh, areas of seating and, and use for these spaces. So um, that's something that we'll come back and, and share with you uh, when that is further, well, when we're into it and uh, then when we uh, get some development on that. And, and following that, we will do a very detailed cost estimate. And uh, after that, uh, we'll roll into construction documents, uh, go through plan check, uh, bid, and uh, award of the construction contract. We estimate that uh, construction will take between 30 and 36 months, and uh, that'll proceed based on whether there's funding for this project. So uh, we are in pursuit of funding right now. So that is the end of our presentation. Now is a time when we really want to hear from you all, get input from you, um, get your comments, uh, things that you think we might, uh, you know, program space that we, spaces that we might need but not have mentioned, um, things that you think aren't necessary and uh, that uh, you know you would like us to use the space in a different manner. Maybe instead of the gallery, you want a meditation room. I don't know. Uh, but this would be the time when we would want to hear from you on that. So uh, we invite anyone who has a question to come on up to the microphone, I think is the protocol. Is that right, Lesson? I guess. OK. And if you could just state your name and whether you're a resident and um, what your question is. Hi, I'm Trudy. Is it on? Hmm. Okay. Yep. There you yes. Go. Okay. Thank you. I'm Trudy Anderson, and I'm from Tuesday Musical. And I have been asked to address the presidium that goes across the top of mm -hmm. the uh, um, stage. Yes. Apparently, a lot of times the sound stays in the oops stays in the back instead of projecting out. Okay. Is there any way to open that up or do something inside? Um, we will look at that with our acoustician, okay. and uh, that's a very good uh, input. We have not gotten that before, so thank you for that. Um, I will say the stage is um, getting deeper in two directions, but one of them will help and one of them won't help. So um, we will definitely look at that with our acoustician and make sure we have the right absorptive and reflective surfaces in there okay. to help the sound make its way up. Okay, thank you. Yes, our pleasure. Thank you for that feedback. I hope you saw the piano locations that uh, we put in the auditorium there. We gave you a permanent place for the pianos to not be on the floor. Hello, uh, my name is Felicia Resnick. I'm a resident. Uh, this uh, circulation hall uh, looks nothing like the current library. And uh, this is a historic building, and all we want is the earthquake retrofit. This is, you've completely changed the library there. Um, uh, like for instance, uh, uh, the, the uh, California missions had unreinforced masonry and they've all been rebuilt, many of them have been rebuilt. 
The one in Solvang spent $500,000. There's another one up north that was $750,000. The San Gabriel spent a million to earthquake retrofit there on reinforced masonry. I'm sorry, you're, you're mentioning the missions? Yes, and that okay. includes attach, attaching the roof to the walls, which I know this library needs. Um, I read on the California State retrofit that you're supposed to do minimal uh, uh, adjustments to the buildings to allow for future technology improvements in earthquake retrofitting. You're not, uh, this is a historic building, you're completely rebuilding it, which we don't want. Um, any technology upgrades you propose now are going to be completely out of date in five years. Uh, the city's going to give free uh, internet, they think, to most residents in the, in the fairly near future. Um, this is going to take a lot of time. We just, we just need the earthquake retrofit. We don't want a rebuilt... Uh, this, this library, this picture reminds me of that Glendale Brutalist one you guys were showing. And we don't want a Brutalist one. We want our historic library the way it is now. Um, I think, you know, I think the bathrooms are fine. I like the way the bathrooms are now. Uh, I think I don't want the stacks moved. I like the stacks the way they are. I don't really want, I don't want skylights. Those skylights look, look weird. They're completely different from the way the library looks now. Um, there, you know, there, there are many retrofits in, in Los Angeles. You don't need to re rebuild them. You know, this, you're completely rebuilding the library. I just want it to look the way it does now. Uh, just do the earthquake retrofit, please. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Uh, I will just make a couple of comments just to uh, make sure that you understand what's there now. So um, this is maybe in reverse order, but the skylights were uh, original to the building. Um, they are there now. You just can't see them because of the way the stacks uh, cover them up. That stack area was not, that's currently there now, was not original to the building. That was put in in the 1980s and uh, is um, definitely not in character of the historic building. And so we're, we're trying to navigate between what has, we're, we're making interventions in spaces that had already been um, uh, modified, as opposed to making interventions in spaces that had not been modified. And that is uh, consistent with the, the advice we're getting from our historic consultant. And uh, relative to the tech updates, um, that will be outdated in five years. Uh, you can imagine the ones that are there now are very outdated already. Um, but uh, I, I do appreciate your comments. We've taken good notes and we will um, certainly factor them into our further discussions on what we're doing and see if there's uh, a way to uh, address your comments. Hello. I'm Valerie Siegel and I'd like to share with you my feeling of coming in from the north entrance. Mm -hmm. I've al always felt that it was kind of scary mm -hmm. to come in. It was always very enclosed and dark. You had to go around the corner to get to the main hall. But when I saw in your presentation this really radical change to both entrances, it didn't feel right to me. I don't think it's consistent with the integrity of the first requirement that the community has laid out for you, which is to maintain the historic flavor. There's many things I like about it, uh, but if I were in that room, it wouldn't feel like the Pasadena Public Library to me. So what I would like, Tim, if you could maybe, in a smaller venue, uh, bring this presentation to more people. I'd like the board of the Linda Vista Library Associates to be able to see this because we would want to be involved in any capital campaign that you had and or will have. And uh, please consider that there's just a lot of people in Pasadena that are very invested in the public library. And informal conversations that I've had with people, very informal, they've always said to me, maintain the historical character. So I'd be really careful about trying to promote this the way it is now. You may alter maybe the color of it, you know, make it more wood paneled or, you know, something, whatever. I'm not telling you you're the design expert. 
And when it comes to the landscaping, I would say more trees. Don't make it complicated for children. Hmm. You know, hopscotch is only, you know, 10 squares. And um, I think it looks interesting and I love landscaping. And I will look forward to seeing what your future plans are, but don't make it complicated for children. Thank you very much. Valerie, thank you. And I will reach out to you about that presentation that you asked about. Happy to do that. Good evening. Now, my name is John Faber. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on some of the things presented tonight. I, I thank you for the presentation. It's great graphics, I have to say. It's very powerful. I, uh, I, I wanted to follow up a couple of particular points here. One question I had was that there, there was a cost estimate done in October of 2021, $111 million. Mm -hmm. That number is now about $150 million. But what I wanted to ask was, how could they do a cost estimate if they didn't have a, a basic design? How, how, how did that happen? You know, I, I actually, I saw the materials on the city board, and uh, it sort of came out of the air. <laughs> there, wasn't, there wasn't any explanation. I, I, I did see that uh, KPFF had uh, done a, a bid proposal at about the same time, and uh, that had some, some detail to it. So I was, I was, trying, to, <laughs> well, I was trying to figure that out, is, is, is how did they do the 2021 cost estimate of $111 million. I could speak to that, no. uh, Mr. Favre. So uh, in summer of 2021, a couple months after uh, it was recognized that the building needed to be retrofitted, the city manager at the time was uh, asking us about a sense of what the scope might be and also an approximate cost. Now, mind you, we hadn't done all the due diligence that we have been working on for the past two years. And like you said, nor did we have a design consultant on, on hand, and none of the design was done. So typically, at that point, we did have a professional cost estimator come in and just look in a sense of square footage overall and based on other similar type of projects. So I think that was kind of an average number at the time. Okay. So it was a really an order, uh, an order of magnitude. It wasn't necessarily what I would call a cost estimate. Right. But now that, you know, we're now continuing and moving forward. Right, right now, right. you know, we are, we did have a cost plan Put no, no, together. I, I understand. I was just trying yeah. to focus on that. I, I just couldn't understand it. It just it seemed to yeah. come out of the blue, honestly. And uh, so, okay, yes. I understand. So you take roughly a square footage, you multiply the square footage times more or less average. Yeah, cost in a of sense, repair, that's what it you was. Come up with the number. Okay, yeah. got it. That. did okay. not include the sense of comprehensive. Right. You know, right. Which we now have. Oh, I appreciate with that. Historic preservation and so on. Right. Okay. Then I wanted to, I wanted to ask Tim about a couple of questions. Uh, well, one was. Uh, you said there had been a, a uh, review uh, w with uh, an, another another agency, another group had done a, a, a kind of a, a kind of a questionnaire, and uh, I wonder what you were talking about. It was, it was what, do, what do we need? And you said that the the program committee had views that were consistent with some other questionnaire. And that, uh, what is that? I think I know the, what you're asking about. So the programming committee was formed and began meeting in September of 2022, met over the course of several months and produced a report, their recommendations of vision for the project, which included a very strong recommendation to continue the community engagement process. And Deborah's team um, was charged with creating a robust community engagement plan, and her findings have agreed with the recommendations of um, the community programming committee. There has not been a great deal of, dis, uh, of country, uh, disagreement between what that original committee put forth and what we've found by listening to the community since then. So, okay, I, I, okay, did you do any polling? That, that was the other Thanks, that's where I was in it. So yeah. we're trying to collect um, feedback through a variety of mechanisms. And 
one of the, if I could ask Deborah to go to the last slide. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that was so, teed up nicely. You know that sometimes, I appreciate everyone being here, and I know that not everybody may be comfortable coming up to the microphone and giving input or asking questions, so I appreciate it. On the screen now, is two QR codes, if you take your phone out and put your camera on and turn them toward the screen, the one on the left will take you to the, the Retrofit Project webpage, where you can see right. um, progress in the project. The one on the right is a community survey where you could get your... The opposite, your, but yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, thanks. <laughs> I'm a little dyslexic. Uh, so you could provide input um, through that online survey if you wish. So, no, but that's not my question. Was there a polling of the citizens? I, I, I understand that you hear people, <laughs> random people stand up with random ideas <laughs> that uh, may be good, may not be so good, you know, who's to say? But what I mean was, did you poll the citizens? Did you go out and you say, you know, you know, how much do, do we need more space below? You know, do, do we uh, do, should we have more books, less books? You know, that that kind of a polling. I, I take it the answer is no, but I, I just was curious. There have there has not been a poll that asks those questions. The one on the screen now gets at those similar issues. What type of programming would what type of uses would you like to see in the library? That's. Right. That's that, the that current the survey that's up respond. now. I'm, I'm sorry, the, that was random responses to the to the to the website. Is that right? It wasn't you that you went out to a thousand citizens and said, uh, you know, the people we put on our committee think these are good ideas, or you know, should we have bigger library, bigger bathrooms? You know, should we, you know, et cetera. Right. That kind of a poll is what do you really want? Which is rather that's quite different than, you know, you know, comment if you want to. Thank you. Yeah, we will continue to try to seek feedback through as many different channels as we can. Ms. Okay, no, thank no, you. Yeah, I appreciate that. The answer is no, there wasn't any polling. So let me, then, then here's the other question that I had. You know, when we had the uh, vote on the uh, new, the reenactment of the uh, parcel tax for the ongoing expenses, uh, I, I was astounded to, to see the representations that uh, all of the services that were being provided before the close of the library would be continued to be provided at exactly the same level for the next 15 years. And that all, all of the meetings and uh, virtually all of the services were now being provided through the branch libraries. I, I want to say the city, the city website says there are 10. They, they had in Villa Park. <laughs> but I, I wondered if, if there had been any, uh, any current statistics on how many meetings weren't occurring or how many services were not being provided. It, 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 and there was some data on that at the time, and I wonder if there's any current data on it. Thank you for the question. Let's go back to the number of branches. We do have nine permanent branch libraries, and we've added a temporary one at Jefferson um, okay, Elementary that's School. Okay, the 10th, right? The tenth it shows 10 library. on the website yeah. if you count them right. on the website. But no, all yeah. right, right. Yeah. Now, all those branches, yeah. and then the, so, other, the other services are available you know, there, there are a lot of uh, adjacent libraries around here. You know, there's a good one in South Pass, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah. nearly everything, all the information you need is, is, nearly all the information in the world is online. So, yeah. so I don't know if anyone's missing any information. You know, I, don't, yeah. I know there are 300,000 books in the stacks we can't get to, but, but I don't know how, the, how much that's hurting us. That's what I'm trying to ask. Thanks for the, the question. I would say that we are not um, at the capacity that we are when Central Library was open. And I could give you a lot of examples of um, things that we are not able to offer now or services that we are offering now that take a much longer time than they would. You know, for example, the ability to go in and browse the shelves yourself and pick out the book that you want and check it out no, that's in minutes. I, I, I will take that. will take much longer now. Um, well, that's, that's not even quite possible. So I mean, there's a difference between. Maybe, right. Thanks. Yeah. So there is a difference in the number of services and the difference in our ability to, to do them in a timely manner. Right. Both. Right. Right. I, I, just, I just want to compliment the branches. I, I go to the San Rafael branch. They have a lot of meetings and uh, great services and. Uh, and you know, the interesting thing about that is that when they built the Central Library, it was the library, basically. It was one other branch. But now there are nine other branches. <laughs> and uh, you want to say, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's a lot of service, which is, I think, a good thing. But I just wanted to know how much we were hurt. Okay, now then I, I wanted to, uh, uh, I 
think I have one other question. It has to do with the parking lot. You know, I, 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 I go to the parking lot, and uh, sometimes it's full. And uh, I used to go to the parking lot, and sometimes it's full. And I, I have the very clear sense that a lot of lawyers at the courthouse are filling it up, and that there's no, there's no real control on, on the use of the, of the parking lot. There are hardly any free parking lots in Pasadena, so it's very attractive. If, I, I couldn't understand whether they did add new space or they didn't add new space, and how, how the spaces serve the demand. Is, is there any information about that? Yeah, so I'll, I can talk a bit about that. Yeah. So we're, we're reconfiguring the lot. So one of the things that we heard anecdotally from many people was how often there were conflicts between cars that were head on, and we started looking into it and we found that the drive aisles were all undersized. And added to that, what did you say? The, the, what? The, the drive aisles were too narrow. Oh, yes, they weren't right. big enough for two cars to pass. They were only 20 feet wide, and two cars couldn't pass. Right. And then on top of that, the stalls were only 16 feet deep. So too narrow a uh, drive aisle and too short a stall meant that cars were poking out into the drive aisle, making it even narrower. And so they were often head on. Um, you know, cars driving in opposite directions head on. So the parking lot it has spaces, but they're not very easy to use. And when people have cars that are bigger than the two small spaces, they take up two spaces instead of one. So it's not very efficiently used either. So we're reconfiguring it so that we, we're maintaining basically the same number of spaces, might be a couple less than are there right now. Um, but by doing one-way circulation, and making the stalls the proper size, making diagonal parking, and uh, we are, um, you know, impacting some of those walking islands that were in between that are basically uh, hardscaped. And there's some trees in there, but there's a, a lot of paving as well. And so by reconfiguring it, we can actually make the spaces work better, function better, and mitigate the potential for people to um, I appreciate you know, that. Uh, that's, that's cross each other. Like, let me clarify my question. Okay, sure. Right. I, I have the feeling that the parking is inadequate now and will be more inadequate once we have a, the best library in the world. <laughs> so, so I wonder if there's any way of dealing with uh, the increased uh, volume that, you're, that we're likely to have. Or, or even the old volume. The old volume was, you know, it's, it was, you know it, it, it's overcrowded a long times during the day and there's, there's no enforcement that it's for, for library use. You know, there might be a way of getting uh, lawyers out of there earlier in the morning and uh, you know when you've got multiple meetings going on there's just there just isn't any place to park in there thank you yeah we appreciate it and i know we have heard similar comments about shortage of parking i mean uh, we are trying to do our best within the space that it is available to make right. it the best use uh, that we can for you know for the community but right aside from having to do more work whether on site or finding elsewhere and the it's really beyond the the focus of this project but it's certainly one that Something you know we about, are trying yeah. to do our best yeah no let me give you the uh, draconian thing that's going on in pasadena is that some commercial lots uh are starting to put in uh meters so <laughs> that's that's one way of limiting the use and uh, others are, uh, you know, requiring, uh, the one Los Angeles requires uh, a, a stamp that you went in the library. And something like that might, might turn, get faster turnover. It's, it's a you. good suggestion, and uh, yeah. definitely take that to heart. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Alex Grosjean. I've been a Pasadena uh, resident for over a decade now. Proud, love it here, tend to stay forever. Uh, you know, I just, I want to come up and actually say something a little different about how excited I am about the project. I think a lot of thought has gone into this design and I know we're just hearing in our presentation for years of work and thought and discussion. And so I just want to say I'm, I'm really excited about how you're taking the time to think about how to preserve the library, but also make it relevant and useful for generations to come. Uh, you know, I, I love the idea of using 
the seismic retrofit and even life safety systems and being in the mindset of while we're in there and doing all this work and spending all this time in this really invasive upgrades, let's do some other modest improvements. And so I'm really excited about the circulation hall and the mezzanines and kind of how we're preserving but improving and, and really make a nice, beautiful space with a ton of natural light. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate that you're kind of taking this time to do all this community input. Uh, I think it seems like you're doing more than I would have expected, and I think that's really generous. Um, and so my, actually, my only question I think is a little different. It's more programmatic. Uh, so I love the idea of having a place to actually read a book. I want to use a library for a library, and uh, I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about places to actually read, uh, preferably with tons of natural light, but at least some. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Thank you for the comments. One thing that did not come out in this presentation, because we really did focus on it, I think, at the last community presentation, is that the, the process of retrofitting this building does include this very careful cataloging of all the historic elements mm -hmm. that will need to be removed and then replaced at the, at the completion of the project. So many of the spaces that we didn't cover today, the Great Hall, the Humanities Wing, the Reference Wing, will be preserved and look just as they, uh, as they did when Myron Hunt opened the building. Um, the kind of the more dramatic changes, I'll use that word for lack of a better word, that we're seeing today are in areas that are not uh, affecting, uh, are not touching those um, character defining spaces. So the circulation hall, uh, those four stacks of floors that we would walk into if we went to the building now are not original to the building. Right. And I think we do need to listen to the entire community to get that room right, you know, like that, that we don't want it to, we want it to be in conversation with the building and not, not, um, uh, not compete with the Great Hall. But uh, there's an opportunity to make an enhancement there. Uh, your question about reading spaces, yes, right. The, there, will, there will be plenty of areas in the library for study and for reading. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I invite everybody at the end of the meeting to take a look at the, the renderings uh, that are on display on the easels to see some of those spaces there. Yeah, and, and one of the things that will really come about in the next uh, phase of our design is looking at how to create different character of spaces and how many mm -hmm. different types of spaces there are. What, what we do know from uh, our um, research and discussions with people is that uh, people like to work and study in very different manners. Some people want to be at a rigid table with a wood uh, table with a wood chair. Others want to be, you know, sitting in a loungy chair and you know being able to put their feet up. Um, we had some people say, "Please make sure there's a space I can sit on the floor and read a book." Uh, so we need to be cognizant of all the different ways that people like to utilize a library, uh, study, work, read and uh, make sure that we're uh, making a variety of spaces. So there won't be just one type of seating area. There will be many different types of seating area to, uh, areas, some small groups, some individual, so that you don't have to be sitting near another person, uh, some larger groups where people can have conversations without annoying uh, the people around them. But thank you for that question. Thank you. Can't wait to see it, and thanks for all your hard work. When is the next uh, town hall like this going to be? I, I just barely heard about this one in time. It, you flushed it on the screen, I thought, but I, I, it was too fast. I couldn't see it. We have one in January. Leslie, do you know when that is? OK. It, it is TBD at this moment, but we will try and get the word out uh, as early as we possibly can. And, and what's the current uh, estimate? I know the last time you had the last meeting, it was 250 plus 90 million if we didn't act quickly. So what's the current estimate, please? Yeah, so the construction costs are uh, approximately 150 million. This is going back to that same budget, and the project costs are 195 million, and that's what was um, discussed with uh, city council. Okay, because at the last meeting you said 250 million, and then plus it was no, be no, nine. no, it was never and then that. Then it was going to be another uh, 90 million if we didn't act quickly. No, 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 uh, not not that at all. I'm sorry. 
Um, and so, so um, it, it is uh, 175 to 195 million was the project cost estimate. So let me just explain that project costs includes uh, what's called soft costs and hard costs. So it's an all-in number. It includes uh, construction contingency and it includes uh, escalation, which is the anticipation of how much more things will cost when we're in the middle of construction. And so this is really a, a number that factored everything in. And so the award of the construction will be less than the range of the project costs. And the and construction includes fees and everything like that? that I'm sorry, I didn't hear that? It, that's going to include fees and everything else? Yeah. Yeah. And the one caution or caveat I should make is that this is based on a point in time. If for some reason the schedule is not met, those costs will go up. That's going to be the extra $90 million you predicted last time, right? I'm, I'm sorry, meeting. for some reason. At the last meeting, the one at Jefferson? No. Uh, oh, so I, I think I know what you might be referring to. So the one, um, said, the one that was over on, Villa, on uh, Fair Oaks. Yeah, so we did discuss with City Council that there are things that have to be done to the building and things that don't have to be done to the building right now to remove the red tag. And the things that have to be done to remove the red tag um, are, uh, what's, that, that's the 150 million, that's the project cost for those things. And the other 40 million, 42 million are the, uh, I'll say the other things such as upgrading the mechanical system, which doesn't have to be done to lift the red tag, but if it's done, that's an added cost, and Wi-Fi, et cetera. So the 175 to 195 was everything, including all of the nice, you know, the mechanical system and the Wi-Fi and all of that. If we pair it back to only what's needed to lift the red tag, that goes down to uh, 150 million project. The caution was that that $42 million, if we do that in the future, and so the idea being you're not going to complete a project and then immediately do these other things, that wouldn't make any sense. So we had our cost estimator take a, a thought of if you complete the building, so it reopens in 2028, and then five years later, you decide you're going to replace the mechanical system and the, enhance the Wi-Fi and all those other uh, things, that $42 million goes up to $90 million. So that's where the 90 comes in. If you don't do those things that are not required but prudent to do, if you don't do those right now, their cost will increase because of the cost of money and escalation over time. So I think that might be what you're referring to. But our base project, all in, with every contingency thought of, every fee, plan check fees, inspection fees, furniture, all in, 175 to 195 is the uh, cost plan range for that total project cost with everything. Good evening, my name is Kelly Newquist and I am a third generation Pasadena resident and I'm raising my five kids here as well. Spent many wonderful hours in this library with my kids and um, I can vouch for that lift that you had. So glad that that's gonna be a ramp now. Getting strollers up and down is terrible. Um, and thank you for talking about the seating as well. I, the garden looks beautiful. I would request some seating with the back to be able to sit and enjoy reading outside. And that's then, actually a code requirement, so yes, we yeah. absolutely will do that. <laughs> Great. And then um, I appreciate you mentioning also how you've tried to maintain the historic look of like the great room, I love the dark wood, and some of those other rooms we weren't able to see. This is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Love the lighting and everything. I can understand the concern. It maybe seems much more modern in you know contrast to the historical look of the rest of the library but I know that you were doing your best to maintain that so I appreciate that 
And my final question is, you mentioned about funding from the state, grants, and things like that. Is there funding that you are asking for from residents and just fundraising in general to help with this project, or is it strictly from the state, city, things like that? Thank you for asking. Um, the city staff is committed to pursuing every available dollar for the construction phase of this project that we can find. So that will mean applying for grants from every entity that we can find, federal, state, nonprofit, okay. um, philanthropy, non <laughs> um, there, um, we have a good partner with uh, an institution called the Pub Pasadena Public Library Foundation, okay. which for several decades has um, um, had funds made available for capital improvement projects at Central Library. Um, uh, they have set up a donation link for people that may be interested in contributing to, to this fund. Okay. Um, uh, and then concurrent with all of those avenues that we will be pursuing, uh, if, there is, if we are not able to raise the full amount that is needed for construction, we are on uh, a timeline that would allow city council to consider going to the public with a bond to fund the construction okay. or any difference that needs to be made up that right. we're not able to raise in the interim. So, okay. So, yeah. No decision has been made on that yet, but we're trying to meet the deadline that would be possible potentially to go to voters in November of 2024 if we needed to. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Spencer. I'm an architect. And I'm also, uh, there are three other architects here in attendance, all members of the AIA Pasadena and Foothill chapter. I don't think that any one of us anymore questions the need for some form of retrofit on the library. At, in the early stages, we thought maybe the building would calculate and structural retrofit wouldn't be needed. But I think most can accept that the building is better than we thought, but still not good enough. There are three structural retrofit schemes that have been proposed. Uh, one is to cut the brick out and put in columns to support the roof and the floors. Um, the second one is what they call base isolation that was done for the city hall. And the th along with the columns, so of course that one becomes more expensive. And then the third is the shear wall solution, which is the current preferred method. And what we're proposing is a fourth solution that has been done particularly with buildings that have character-defining features both on the interior and the exterior, where this is conundrum of what do you do, you know, with the shear wall solution, you have to cut out roughly 12 inches of all the brick from floor to all the way to the structure up above. I calculated some, somewhere in the range of 4,000 to 5,000 tons of brick being taken out of the building. And then somewhere around 5,000 tons to 6,000 tons of concrete being added. So what we're trying to do and encourage you to, to hire a structural engineer who is experienced with the center core method, which is the fourth possible alternative. It's a method where you drill into the walls all the way from the roof down into the foundation and you anchor the building with steel where the steel doesn't exist now. So that's the main gist of what we're saying is that there, there's somebody out there that is capable of cal calculating it and we urge you to hire them. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your comments, Jim. Can you, um, Jim, is it possible, f Jim? <laughs> I, I, just since you mentioned that you were speaking on behalf of three architects, it, can you, for our benefit, identify those three architects? I couldn't hear what you said. Uh, since you, you said you were speaking on behalf of two other architects, can you identify them? Three, three, actually. Or three other, okay. Oh, can you tell us who they are? Just, just curious. Joe Catalano. 
Winston Thorne, who's been on the, bond, the technical oversight committee, and Richard McCann, which is in the far. Great. And both Thanks. Joe and Richard have done center court projects. Great. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other comments or questions from our crowd here? Okay, well, hearing none, thank you all for spending your evening with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, we appreciate the input that we've uh, garnered. Hopefully you've appreciated hearing some um, uh, greater detail. And uh, we will keep you posted on the next one of these. Thanks. <laughs>